Welcome to Sales and Marketing Talk Show. I'm your host, Samuli Salonen, and today we have a guest from Berlin, uh, Inken from Hubspot, Hubspot, and Inken is their marketing director for EMEA. And today we will be discussing about customer acquisition. And we can actually start things off by introduction. So, Inken, would you tell our viewers who are you? Who am I? Yeah, um, you already mentioned I work for HubSpot. Um, I've been at HubSpot for over six years, I'm kind of growing everything outside of Northern America um, since HubSpot originated in the US. So I've been responsible for growing all of our European regions mainly in the past years. And it's been a fun ride. And part of that is, is customer acquisition and um, to really kind of fuel our growth in, in that region. Great. Sounds good. And as said, today we will discuss uh, customer acquisition and we will go through uh, what is customer acquisition, then talk a little bit about acquisition marketing and different strategies to do that one. And then something about measurement and how, how we should measure our customer acquisition. Uh, but we could actually start things off by defining customer acquisition. Uh, on your website, I read a blog post regarding on that one, and over there it says that customer acquisition is the process of bringing new customers or clients to your business. But could you open that a little bit more to our listeners? Sure, yeah. So when we think about acquiring new customers, it really comes down to acquiring traffic first, right? So you want to if you're handling all your business mostly online, then traffic is your number one place where you start. And for traffic to come to your site, it's it's mainly content driven, right? So what we are specializing in um, HubSpot and also in our marketing team is really just you know connecting people with our brand through um, challenges they're facing that we can solve um, with our content. And then um, we kind of attract those traffic people over and um, kind of convert them over um, to become a lead and become a contact in our database. And for all this to happen really is all you need is like a really good content strategy um, on top of like a good go to market strategy. So I think to put it into a nutshell is content driven. There is some kind of measurement that we're going to talk about as, as well and some kind of tools you will need. But the core and the heart of it is, is really the content that you need. Yeah, and you at HubSpot really are making a lot of good content. And uh, yeah. you, are, you are easy to find from Google if you like. For example, I'm like a lot of, or I'm Googling a lot of things regarding sales and marketing. And I think that whatever you are searching <laughs> regarding on those <laughs> stuff, there will be content from HubSpot on the first page almost every time. So you have done a great work with that one. Uh, if we then start to think about like acquisition marketing and different strategies on that one, uh, you said that content marketing is, is something that you work greatly and we could actually go through with different ways of doing that one and actually start, for example, on the blogs. Uh, what do you think, what are most important things when you are doing blogging and when, when should companies start a blog? I think that, um, you know, blogging is a really great way to kind of build your own brand and to build your own thought leadership on top of obviously generating um, new contacts. That is almost the beauty coming out of it, right? You're kind of building your own thought leadership. And on top of that, the plus is you get people coming to your site and then you can try to convert them into a contact for your business. So I think like any company who wants to generate traffic and who wants to generate business online should start doing some blogging. And um, I think like we're far away from like the corporate kind of PR blog that we all used to have, you know, where we just publish things that went live in the press or we just talk about ourselves, um, you know, new products we have coming up. It's really just about like 
building your strategy from from the ground like who's the persona you want to reach what are their current challenges how can you help them what's your expertise in your given area and um yeah start from there pretty much yeah and as you said that it's very important to like understand your customers who are your ideal customers and what kind of content they want to go through what do you think what is the best way to figure out what your customers would love to read about talk to your customers so it, <laughs> it's it's actually that simple right i think um anybody in marketing right now is talking a lot about like solving for the customer and like really having good retention numbers and for that to be true you need to connect with them and to be close to them and i think in marketing we always shy away from that connection sometimes because we're like so you know driven by like metrics and numbers and we talk with other marketers and we make these assumptions but we never go talk to people and it's the sales team that then usually comes to us and says hey have you thought about this and like what about that that here are the challenges i'm hearing constantly on the phone people want to redesign their website and they don't know how to do this so i think it really comes down to us sitting down talking having conversations inviting people you know over zoom to have a chat with us and to understand what they're facing because i think even if we're also marketers right in marketing um our challenges are different than what our customers are facing yeah exactly that is something that every marketer and actually also every sales people should, should remember to ask your clients what they want uh, then from blog post we could go to different kind of ebooks for example and then maybe the one question that has been asked a lot lately on marketing should all content be on your website or should there be catered content yeah what i think, it's, think that is a great question i think um whenever you give something away that is super valuable and i think that is it is fair to gate that i think um the main main kind of principle you should have is you should try to add value before you take value out of your connection and really try to sell to those connections so i think um the first touch point ideally is some sort of ungated content like a blog post um you know a webinar or like something on social where people connect with you initially and they come mainly from search and then what you then offer afterwards is some sort of gated offer either an ebook um for hubspot we are very fortunate that we have an academy so we can also guide people through you know video content in our academy and you can sign up um but i think there is some kind of you know um value to adding some kind of gated form in between so you can also start building meaningful connection with those uh, people coming in yeah exactly but i think like what many companies do they have some kind of gated content and at the moment that uh, potential customers give their email address and they start to do the selling straight away calling the client that hey do you want to yeah. buy from us what do you think when should sales people then contact the potential client is it right after the people have downloaded some ebook from your site yeah i think that you know you can kind of see the different phases people go through the initial phase is always kind of like oh i have this kind of thought in my mind like i have a challenge i have a problem and i go google about it and i might not even know yet that i need software or i need a service or anybody to help me with that and then i think there there's no time yet to reach out to that person i think that person is just doing their job and researching finding solutions and then when you get to like you know the ebook kind of webinar phase or whatever is your content in between people are still thinking about hey you know i'm trying to build a facebook page i'm just looking for a quick answer and not necessarily somebody to call me up the next day and say like hey do you want to buy marketing automation software and i'm like i just want to build a facebook page <laughs> so i think there is is a big kind of in between um where you have to figure out based on actions people take and that's i think why it is so important to have that content um somehow gated so you can kind of see mm, what content is downloaded um how many interactions have we had with that person has that person been on our pricing page on the website have they requested to talk to sales have they engaged with us through our chat 
Um, there are many ways, I think, nowadays for customers to also reach out to us and to say, hey, I'm ready. I want to talk to you. And to make that as easy as possible. On top of that, obviously, you know, shielding the contacts from sales um, before, you know, you want to say like, hey, now they're qualified. They have kind of gone into our product for free. Um, obviously, freemium model is a really great option there if you can kind of see engage interest uh, from that perspective. Yeah, great. Sounds good. Um, how about then if we go like from written content to other forms of content, for example, videos or podcast or, for example, this LinkedIn Live is some kind of content. What do you think? Will there be more videos, more voice? And when should companies start to use those? Yeah, I mean, there's already kind of like, you know, a shift happening now that we're in this situation. A lot of people working from home, I think you've seen a lot of companies immediately shifting to like podcasts, doing more webinars. I think that is great. You know, it's it's the right shift, I think, um, that needs to happen. It's like we try to um, kind of go into that direction where people find it most useful to uh, digest the content content i think with podcasts what's interesting is that it's now also you know transcripts are indexed in google so i think that again might help you with your organic search um after you're building up some some nice followership over there and i think then linkedin one of my favorite channels honestly because i think if you're a ceo if you're in marketing if you're in sales and you're not on linkedin you're not building yourself a community you're wasting your time you know i think that nowadays you need to be there you need to be part of that conversation i think it's it's one of the strongest networks for b2b certainly yeah exactly what do you think if we think about linkedin and then there is like basically two two parts there is there like company side that the company have a linkedin page and what kind of content you do you produce over there and then there is the other one uh, your sales people your marketing people your your professionals, which do you think is more important to you guys and how, for example, you have been helping your people to be more active on LinkedIn? Yeah, I think that um, we we just did a workshop a couple of weeks back about this, actually, um, when we were before kind of lockdown stage, you know, everybody was still able to meet in the office. And we talked about like generating awareness for HubSpot and specifically talked about LinkedIn because um, we're getting a lot of reach on our in individual accounts, you know, by just posting something, posting advice tips. And we were like, okay, versus company page, like how do we bridge that gap and what do we want to do? And I think that we said that I think it is smarter to, to build followership for kind of key people in your organization or people who already are doing a lot of posting on, on social media and to kind of have those be your evangelists, your influencers from your own company and to build kind of connections through that because A, connections are gonna be more meaningful. I think that one-on-one -on -one connections are, you know, what we prefer and a brand page at the same time where, you know, it can be great that you do some posts there, but it's normal, right? When you go through your feed, where do you stop? Do you stop? at the post from SAP about like how to improve your business or do you stop at my post where it's like, hey, I just had a meeting with my team last week. We talked about this. Here are some learnings. So I think yeah. um, we see a tremendous value in like just creating content that feels natural and that feels real. Yeah, exactly. And then if we talk, to talk about different kind of like content, there is of course like the blogs and eBooks then the social media that we talk a little bit about them. I think one interesting thing that you guys do a lot is email marketing as well. And uh, it works works for me as, at least. And all the like automation that is behind there. For example, I uh, ordered your blog post on sales to me. And then at some point I noticed that I don't have enough, enough time to open all the emails. And then I got an email regarding that one and that from now on, I will get only one message per week regarding on that one. So could you open up a little bit more on like, how much do you guys send emails to your customers and potential customers? And what kind of results do you have there? 
Yeah, I think emails are still super important. I think you still reach a lot of people in their inbox. I think it's it's still like you know, the one channel. I think that um, people connect throughout different businesses with each other. So one kind of you know more drastic step we've taken is uh, we have heavily reduced the amount of emails that we're sending to our audiences because I think. The more you automate, the more you, you realize like how dangerous it can be of a trap that you over email to your audience and you have people subscribe to your blog, you have people downloading an offer, you have people you know, who've, who've started signing up for your free CRM and then suddenly you have them in three, four different nurture programs that, that can't happen at the same time. So you have to be really coordinated on that approach. Plus we have um, drastically decided that if somebody like you, you know, who stopped kind of opening up our emails, we, we kind of gauge, oh, they're no longer interested or it's just too much. It seems that the volume is not um, acceptable that we ask you, what do you want? Do you want to, you know, now receive less emails? Do you want to opt in back to like a weekly send? So I think like giving people the freedom and decide what they want to subscribe to is crucial nowadays. Yeah, and I think like it, it works at least for me. Uh, I got a good good feeling about that one. If I compare it to some company who is like sending so much of the email, at some point I just unsubscribe <laughs> from there. <laughs> Great. Uh, then we could actually talk a little bit about the measurements. So, how do you think how a company should measure their customer acquisition? Yeah, I think that um, first of all, I think like, you know, what does um, a valuable lead mean to you? I think you need to define that. Um, where does it become interesting for you to reach out to that person? And where do you think they are qualified enough to, to be able to talk to sales? I think that's something you need to define for yourself and kind of gauge like when that um, action needs to be taken. And um, I think that... Um, measuring it with like an SLA between marketing and sales is super helpful because you're driving more alignment there. So for us, how we think about it is whenever a lead comes in from a marketing perspective, um, we kind of see how much they progress to the next stage to become a qualified lead. So imagine somebody signs up for an ebook and two days later, they um, decide to get the CRM for free. So they now are a sign up. And that's the time where I think we can more engage with them a, in the portal. So we can kind of show them around and be like, hey, here are the features. Plus they can decide to talk to sales themselves or sales can kind of you know, start looking into those uh, contacts and, and reach out on their end. And I think um, kind of measuring that throughout will give you insight into how long is your usual sales cycle? What is the actual close rate from somebody going from content lead to sign up or coming from you know, sign up immediately and closing? Um, and you have all these different ways of measuring then what's the most best or like the best conversion path for your business. And you kind of know what's the average sales deal size and you can kind of learn from those you know, numbers as well and see if your channel or your customer acquisition strategy is healthy or if it's not, right? If, if nothing is converting and, you know, all you're getting is like just traffic but not qualified traffic, then you're clearly doing something wrong and there's something to fix at the very, very top of your funnel. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I read a study actually from your website that says that in the last five years the cost of acquiring new customers has increased by over 50 percent uh, so it's like very important to companies to understand their customer acquisition cost so could you tell our listeners how should company uh, calculate their customer acquisition cost yeah, I think there are obviously different ways to do this. Um, you can count in marketing as a cost center. So your employees, obviously, you can also just say like, oh, it's all the marketing budget that we're putting in initially to convert somebody to become a lead. So let's say we spend like a million dollars on Facebook ads. That's a very easy calculation, how many leads you get out of that, what's the close rate out of them, and if they're quality leads or not. All of that is can kind of associated to um, customer acquisition cost um, because you have all your historical data, you know, the average close rate over three months period. Um, so I think doing those measurements and knowing like how much you need to put in 
to get, you know, your results is important. But I think at the same time, there's also this, um, you know, this new way of thinking about like, hey, uh, we already have customers. Um, it costs us 10 times more to acquire new ones. Um, don't forget about your customers. Also look after them and um, solve for retention. I think that's that's what we forget a lot of times in marketing. I think that is a mistake a lot of people make to always just look at the new and shiny. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk soon a little bit more about the churn side, but maybe before that one, uh, I said the customer acquisition cost is is important number. And I think the reason behind that one is that if we got two same kind of companies, same, same kind of pro products, the winner company normally is the one that who can lower their customer acquisition cost to a to smaller number. Uh, what do you say? What is a good number for customer acquisition cost? How should you like think? What kind of number should I get? Oh, that is impossible to say because it totally depends on your kind of deal size and you know, like how long your contracts are. What's your what's your business strategy really? Um, Obviously, you know, the, the cheaper, the better almost every time somebody asks like, hey, can we get our costs down to acquire? I think that in any kind of um, from a SaaS perspective, what I can talk about is that in marketing and say it's obviously the, the heavy hitters here. Um, they're like super expensive from that perspective because you're investing a lot upfront um, before you get a return on the subscription model. And I think that's where retention is also so, so super important. Um, and I think that, you know, bringing those down is, is good, but like, don't bring them down and in the way that like, you know, you're no longer adding a lot of value to your initial contacts. And I think that from a perspective on acquiring, like there are obviously various different channels you can kind of optimize by, right? You can say like, I get most of my business through Amazon because I'm like an e-commerce shop and I invest most of my money there. Um, so I think that is so depending on your business model, it's impossible to kind of give any kind of qualitative advice. If you um, are either offering a service, you're having a freemium model, so many different directions you can go, obviously. Yeah, exactly. And I think like one important thing is to understand your like lifetime value of new customers and compare that those, those two numbers. Uh, but yeah, then actually we could talk a little bit about how to minimize your churn. So how to keep the clients that you already have acquired as your clients. So what kind of methods do you do use in HubSpot for that one? Yeah, so for us a long time, I think we also neglected that a little bit, unfortunately. I think we were very, very successful in getting new contacts into our database and generating traffic, leads, all, all of the above. But when it then came to customer marketing, um, I mean, we always had the academy as kind of a way of educating our customers. I think we were really, really um, successful with that. But a lot of times, you know, it ended up being a little bit of a blended mix between what customers would receive on the email side, what leads would receive on the email side. And we didn't really segment in a good way. So we didn't really know what our customers were consuming and what they really wanted. So one was investing into customer marketing, two was investing into a customer um, kind of challenge team um, where that team is purely focused just on solving different kind of friction points in our organization for our customers. And that could be product problems, that could be onboarding issues, that could be problems they bring up with our services team. So having one team um, that is kind of the voice of the customer that can speak internally for our customers and kind of advocate for, we need to change this process. This is not working. It's working for us internally, but the way it is seen outside is horrible and it's it's not adding any value. That takes a lot of time and we're far away from perfect, but I think we're kind of making the right investments now to bring that more up in our own kind of thinking. Yeah, exactly. And we, we at Advanced B2B, we are, we are using HubSpot and I'm a very happy user, user of the software as well. But uh, what do you think? You have like a lot of different kind of add-ons and integrations to the system as well. Uh, is that one way of making sure that the client will stay 
with you for a longer time. It certainly is, I think, continuously adding value in, in form of new features, um, new abilities in the product is a way. I think there um, is like two ways of, of going about this, right? It's like one is the innovation that you need within your product. That is 100% true. I think if you're like, you know, lo you no longer invest into your own product, I think, you know, people will go elsewhere um, to other companies. But then there's also the human factor in that. I think we all still kind of enjoy that one-on-one -on -one connection. So when it comes to support and services, having somebody you can chat with, you can call, you can email, whatever that is, and you have a really timely response is also crucial because, you know, we all know like when something is wrong with our tech stack, and you suddenly have a problem on Slack and you're like, oh, you know, I just want to have this fixed immediately. Um, that's when it comes down to, you know, customer service, really. Yeah, exactly. And then for the last last minutes of the show, we could actually talk a little bit about the future. What, what do you think that is happening in marketing and sales in the next couple of years? Yeah, I think that it's going to be more important than ever to really have this fast response. I think people no longer want to wait for an answer. You know, I just want to don't want to go to a website, fill out a form and ask them a question and wait like two days to get an answer. I just want to chat with somebody. Um, I just want to also test things before I buy them. I think that is also super important. Um, if you have a service, if you have anything that you sell, that um, I can have sneak peek kind of into. Um, I know what I'm getting. It's the same with like, you know, what we're doing on the ebook side. We give people a couple of pages and chapters to go through before they decide they want to download that. It's the same with any service um, or any vendor. And um, I think customer reviews as well. I think that you should really try to get your customers on board, be the best evangelist for you. Um, and that will kind of help you sell. I think that anytime I now go look for a service, I always look at the ratings first and I always check like, hey, what do other people say about this company? And I think that's going to be more important than ever um, in the coming, coming months and years to make the difference because competition is going to go up. So how do you, do you make the difference in the market, how you stand out in the crowd? Yeah, exactly. And I think like there's many, many companies who has done a great work with like a different kind of referrals programs, for example, Dropbox, who has the model basically built over that one at the start. But uh, how are you using referrals on your sales and marketing at, at HubSpot? So for us, we also have a kind of a program as well where we have... Um, you know, we give our credit to people and certain kind of awards to um, people who are ambassadors for us, who will leave a review, who will jump on calls if somebody else wants to talk to them. Um, so it's also kind of a gratitude program, uh, let's put it that way, where we thank people who are kind of true HubSpot fans who <laughs> want to do um, nice stuff for us and reward them in a nice way. And that can be through one-on-one -on -one consulting as well. Um, that can be through some kind of, you know, free um, access to beta versions on your software. There are multiple ways to go about it. I think that one, again, go back to your customers, ask what would they like to see if they help you out and what's the best kind of, you know, um, kind of um, alignment you can get there and then um, go from there. I think that happy customers, if you ask them, nine out of 10, is always, you know, willing to leave a good review, willing to give you feedback. I've never kind of had somebody on the phone and were like, uh, I'm happy, but I don't want to, you know, help you. I think that um, that's something where they also get a lot of value. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's just super important to like, remember that from your clients, because even though like a lot of people would love to refer you, but if you don't ask for that one, they probably won't won't do that before that one. Uh, now there will be time for your last words and tips for our listeners. If you should give a, the last tip that you want everyone to remember from this conversation, what would it be? Yeah, I think that one advice I always um, like to give is like, 
don't you know shy away from like looking at companies like HubSpot who've already done years of work already on this front. And if you are getting started or you feel like you're still kind of in the early stages, don't be afraid. You know, don't let this stop you. I think that if you are, especially if you are in a kind of some kind of niche B two B industry, um, you can kind of lead the way. Even though um, you know there might be others, I think that don't hesitate. Try try and error. You know, test things out. Um, don't be afraid that things are not going to work out in the first few weeks. Um, and yeah, have some fun with it as well, because I think, you know, uh, we're all talking about data and numbers, but like it kind of needs to become fun for you to really invest into it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for your time, Inken. And thank you for our listeners joining the show. And we will see you again on Friday. Bye bye. Bye, everybody.